it is really, really a gift to be here with you all. And uh, what, I, what I want to do uh, today is um, really spend some time. You know, seminary, Christian college, these are significant places that have an impact on us. Uh, but what I want to do this morning is spend some time talking about a place that is incredibly formative as well, and that is the desert, the desolate places that God sometimes leads his people into. And I want to look at that through the story of Moses. So we're going to take a high-level look at the call of Moses from Exodus 2 and 3. And as we do, I think what we're going to see is this. In fact, I know what we're going to see is this, is that God leads us into the desert in the places of desolation and isolation in order to reveal himself and our calling to us. Now, this is particularly compelling for me in light of the journey that our family has gone on. Uh, so that's my son Judson. Uh, as you heard in the introduction, we lost him when he was two and a half years old. It was actually a crazy thing. It was a crazy thing. Uh, he was totally healthy uh, for the first two plus years of his life. He started stumbling, um, and then he started overreaching. And over time, he lost everything. And that was over a five-month period, right? totally healthy to gone. Uh, and what I have seen, both through that journey in terms of losing him, and then the experience of walking through the very lonely grief journey, is that God works in powerful ways through our suffering that God forms us and shapes us through this crucible. And not only have I seen it through my own journey, but we've watched as we've ministered to hurting people. We have a ministry of faith and hope and suffering, my wife and I. And we, what we've seen is that God works powerfully in this season as we walk closely with other families as well who have lost children to this disease that our son died of. We've seen God work in incredibly significant ways. And so what I want to do again is, let's go to the scripture together. Uh, my expectation is that as we do that, that God will fill us with hope because we know that he is at work. So turn with me uh, to Exodus chapter two. Starting in verse 11. Now, the back, background, we all know most of the story, right? He's a Hebrew. I'm back, I realize, let's give this context. He's a Hebrew. Uh, he, uh, of course, was raised as Egyptian royalty. But he comes of age, and he wants to find out about his own flesh and blood. Starting in verse 11. Now, it came about in those days when Moses had grown up that he went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors. He saw an Egyptian beating Hebrew one of his brethren, one of his flesh and blood. So he looked this way and that, and when he saw there was no one around, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So, I mean, this is a pivotal point in Moses' life, right? Uh, and the language here, the, the, the kinship language gives me the, the sense that you know, Moses is seeing his own flesh and blood and seeing what's going on, and frankly, he's appalled. And he sees, he sees one of his brothers about to be slain, and so he intervenes. Because he sees no one else is gonna come on the scene to help. And it may be the division of coming and helping deliver God's people, but at that time, it became clear they weren't gonna follow his leadership. And so Pharaoh, come, you know, Pharaoh finds out, and he has to flee to the desert of Midian. And so he's cut off from all his relationships and his family. He's cut off from his ability to provide for himself. You can say he was outside of his coverage zone, wasn't he? And this happens to all of us at some point in our lives. And I hope, you know, it, it just, it's part of life, right? Uh, all of us have experienced loss, uh, maybe a loss in a relationship where we, we see um, somebody we thought we were going to have maybe spent a lifetime with 
and it, it just ends. Many of us have experienced in this room, experienced divorce of your parents. And there's a brokenness that comes from that. It, it feels desolate. Uh, I know people that have dealt with mental illness in their family. There's another loss. Where you go, Lord, what are you doing? It could be ministry challenges too. You step in with the best of intentions, you're trying to do the right thing. Like Moses was, felt like he was doing the right thing. But you only end up in a desolate place. And that is the very place that Moses finds himself in. Now what I will say, and what, as you look at the text, that the thing to note for Moses is that in the desert of Midian, he finds, he finds some good. He, uh, he discovers community. He gets married. Uh, but this sense of being out of place continues. And so when he has a son, the scripture says that he named him Gershom. Why? Saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. Pretty emphatic. Kind of reminds you of that, that Beatles song, right? He's a real nowhere, nowhere land man living in his nowhere land. Talk about isolation. This is where Moses is. And this is where a lot of us have lived, isn't it? I mean, if we're honest, we go through these seasons. And it feels desolate. It's disillusioning. We had a, a picture of God. We thought that he was loving and kind. We thought that he was for us. And then the bottom drops out. And in this crisis of faith, we ask the question, did I do something wrong? Does he really love me? Am I really his? And intricately connected to that in, is this crisis of calling as well. Because we, these two are, are really right, they're together. And so what happens is we ask the question, am I, am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? I mean, I'm sure Moses asked that question. I guess I wasn't supposed to be delivering God's people, was I? the sheep around. You know, spending all those years as a shepherd. But, you know, if I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, ask the question, how did I end up here? We uh, have the experience of spending time with a lot of families uh, in, our, in our ministry um, to those, who, again, who are caring for really sick, very sick kids, terminally ill children. And one of the families we become close with, um, you know, uh, Esteban lost his, or found out first that his son was terminally ill, lost his wife to cancer, and then the circumstances related to his own um, care for the child have put him into a situation where he can't actually continue in his vocation. He can't continue the job he's been doing for, he'd worked for a lifetime to do it. And so, you know, the other day he looked at me and he said, there's nothing for me, Drake. There's so much mystery in this place. But one of the things that does happen, there's really, there's something that really good that happens. is that we begin to realize we don't know everything. We realize that we don't have answers. And so when Deuteronomy 8 talks about God leading Israel into the, into the desert and leading them there for 40 years, he talks about leading there to humble them. And so we don't have the answers on ourselves, but at least we're humbled. And what happens is that process prepares us for what's next. And that's certainly what happens 
um, to Moses. So after close to 40 years, he was 40 when he goes into the desert in Midian. And at the start of, of chapter three, as we turn there in a second, he's about 80 years old. But he's now finally ready for what's next. Starting in verse one, of chapter three. Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. There is so much here in this passage. But I, I, wanna, I wanna focus on really one phrase that gets repeated in verses three and four. Did you hear it? Are you seeing it? Notice that while the flame of fire, the angel of the Lord appears in the flame of fire, that is really just the beginning. That was God's, are you listening? And what 40 years had done for Moses is it taken the place where now he turns aside to look at what's happening. Why do we know this is significant? Because now, when not God sees that Moses turned aside, it is, it is only at that point that God speaks. And everything else begins. After decades of isolation, after decades of being in this desolate place, Moses is just now prepared to hear from God and to notice what he would otherwise, have otherwise missed. And you could say he was really out of his service area, right? I mean, again, he was out of his service area. And so the, the desolation, the isolation, the scarcity of the place means that he wasn't gonna get interrupted. And he was humbled by it, so he heard. And so it is for us, right? When these places cause us to be aware of things, of the burning bushes all around us. Yeah, I experienced this about nine years ago when, when my, my son was sick, before he had died, before we knew the full extent of what's going on. And I remember sitting uh, out, on, um, out on the patio of our home in, in Costa Mesa, and I remember thinking to myself, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, that I needed to listen a little more. That I needed to listen for the Lord, not just in the times of crisis, but in the day to day. Because as a Talbot grad and a, uh, a Biola grad and a PhD student, I, I thought I had it all together. I thought I knew God. I thought I knew what I was supposed to be doing. And it was only in that place that God was able to get my attention. And it began something for me that has been transformational. But it begins by turning aside and looking at what God is doing. And so now that God is certain that Moses is going to listen, he speaks. And this is a holy place, starting in verse six. We're on this, verse six. He also said, I am the God of your father. Sorry about that, hold on. Okay, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I'm aware of their sufferings. 
So, so I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Skipping on then to, to verse nine. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel's, Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. So as we see this desolate place is the place of revelation. God now is prepared to share something uh, with Moses, something of who he is, something of his own heart, and something of what he's going to do. Starting in verse six, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I made covenant with your family. He'll go on to reveal his name, Yahweh. But there's a sense of revelation of who he is. Verses seven and nine really dig deeply into God's affection for his people, that he sees what's going on and that he's moved by it. And because he's moved by it, he's prepared to act. And so in verse eight, it talks about what he's gonna do. I have come down to deliver them. Now, this wouldn't be the last time God speaks from that desolate place, as we all know. You know we, see, we see it in Sinai, at Sinai, that God reveals himself to Israel there, that God does the same thing at, at, at Horeb, again, Mount Horeb, again, uh, with Elijah in 1 Kings uh, 19. So so there's this sense in which God is always revealing himself in these places. But for those of us who spend a long time in these places, the reality is it doesn't feel very loving, does it? At least not in the process. we're really tempted to doubt it. We experience a loss, hardship in relationships, financial struggles, whatever it is. And it causes us to question. But it's that time in the desert when we most need to embrace it. And the beauty is that this is the place that he ends up showing up. God is one who remembers his covenant. And for those of us that uh, trust Christ, that we remember that we've been redeemed by precious blood. And so we're God's children, and so he's with us today, and our future is secure. And we need to remind ourselves of those things when we're in those places. But the beauty is, The Spirit does that very thing for us. And I've seen it. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I can only tell my own, talk about my own journey, but I can tell you that in the season where we were at five months where we were caring for a, very, a terminally ill son, a terminal child, that there were mornings that I, I would wake up and I would wake up with a song that he had given me because he loved me and because he knew I needed it. After we lost him, there were times I'd wake up in the middle of the night, again with a song. And this was a a song reminding me of his presence, of his tender care. In those desolate places, we're tempted to believe that God's absent, but he is there and he loves us and he is wanting to reveal himself to us. So now, Moses first receives revelation from God in the the desert. And now he finds his calling as well. Therefore, 
God says, God says to him, come now, I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. So again, God reveals himself in the desert. God calls in the desert. Moses is the first, but he's not the last. Again, you have Israel called from the desert. You have uh, Elijah called from the desert for, for something new God was doing it. John the Baptist. And even Jesus spent 40 days in the desert. This is a place of calling. This is a place where we hear the voice of God leading us into something new. But notice this. In fact, I would say notice the therefore, right? What's behind this this call from God to send Moses to bring his people out of Israel? It's his heart of compassion for his people. We just saw it. That God deeply loves his people and... um, and hears their cries. And so, Moses responds to that call. God sends Moses because he has a heart of compassion. And I think he sends Moses as well because he knows that Moses will track in with that very same heart as we'll see throughout the Exodus. So, this gives me a chance to ask a question. Do you know what you want to do with your life? I would suggest that if you, if you don't know the answer or not certain of that answer, one of the things you want to do is get close to the heart of God. Come close to Jesus Listen to his heartbeat. See what he feels compassion for and respond. Now I will tell you, sometimes you will be hearing that in a place that is really painful. Um, That's where we heard it. That's where my wife and I have heard it. Through our own experience of God's compassion in our deep, dark places, we have become convinced of God's compassion for those who suffer. That his heart breaks for the, for the hurting. That he has compassion for kids like my son and for their parents. And so what it's meant for us is, is we have tracked in with God's heart for these people. What we've realized is, you know, we, we have to go. We have to walk with these people. So we... Part of our ministry of Judson's legacy is um, caring for families, sick kids, and walking with them, knowing that we're gonna probably have to see their, be at their memorial service and watch them say farewell and walk the hard journey of, of grief afterward with them. But you only, we can only do that because we know that that's God's heart and, and it's like his love is poured out in our hearts and now we love from that. We know him, we've experienced that and so we do it out of that love that he has for the people that we serve. Now there's another piece that I think is worth mentioning as we look back to the text. And that's just a big picture, boy, you know, if I wish, I, you know, I, I know that one of my old profs would be proud of this. I, I know, I'm just, I'm setting this up, right? So when you read Old Testament narratives, you know, it's tempting, we, we, the first place we go oftentimes is the character that we're seeing. It's a story. And what's important to do as we read these narratives is to recognize that the background is that this is not about the individual players, This is about a God and his enduring faithfulness to the people of Israel. So Moses' calling is not about himself. It is not about um, 
about what he wants to do. It's about a God who has compassion and again, is wants to deliver his people. And I think for us, it's relevant. Because I, I, I don't know about you, but for me, I mean, I'm tempted, I, I wrestle with this. Like, I want to view this as my story, right? I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of do my thing, right? I'm gonna live my story. I'm gonna do it a certain way. But the fact is, we're part of God's story. It's his kingdom. And thankfully, he gives us a place. But it, it is part of his story. And so it's not about us or about doing great things. God might be calling us to simple, mundane things. And by the way, our lives might not end up the way we expected. But I will tell you this, that to know God, to hear his call, and to do what we're asked is enough. It's more than enough. So, we've spent this time in Exodus and we, we've seen with Moses' story that we really like him, we all go into these desolate places. But what we've noted through Moses is that God is in it. God is in it. And so the Lord uses the scarcity of the place to humble us and to help us to hear him. And he reveals himself and his heart to us. And then finally, he reveals our calling and our place in his story. God doesn't waste our journey. You know, Romans 8, 31 tells it, says it this way, that he's working all things together for our good because we love him. So whatever comes, that's cause for hope, for great hope. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.